It's not the amperage. It's not the travel speed. It is not the gas coverage. It's all of those things and more. And that's part of the secret of welding stainless steel, which we're gonna to cover today only on the fabrication series. All right, so it's really common for people to write into TFS and send some pictures of their stainless work and say, hey, Justin, having some problems here. Maybe you can help me out. It's usually 90% of the time it's just totally cooked. And uh, other times, you know, they want to know about penetration or something like that. Now, I'm not showing you any of their pictures because we do operate in confidentiality. But I did happily cook up some stainless and all the rest of that stuff to kind of show you guys well, what to do and what not to do. Now, there's a lot of information out there about how to weld stainless, but there's not really a whole lot of information about how to not weld stainless. And the other pieces of the equation are extremely important, which is things like torch height, travel speed, all the rest of that good stuff. But I need to start with debunking a few of those myths here. Let's just get it right out of the way. But make sure that you're paying attention because even though you may think that you know about some of this stuff in here because it's very widely spread and very common if you've watched other videos and read a lot of other material, that you may think you know it, but do stick around. Make sure you're paying attention because there's a lot more to the equation. Myth number one, too much amperage or too high of amperage will absolutely positively cook your stainless. That is bogus that is completely false now i know what i just said yes i really just said that and before you go diving for the thumbs down or the uh you know the comments box there hear me out listen to carefully about what we said the myth is that the amperage is synonymous with heat that's the assumption there they are not synonymous they are absolutely not really related a lot of people think that the higher the amperage means higher heat that goes into the part it's not necessarily true there's a lot of other factors that go into that one and there's a lot more that goes into the equation and we're definitely going to get into that and I'm going to show you the differences on the two of them but everybody thinking that too high of amperage uh, equals too high of heat is not necessarily true which leads us right into myth number two myth number two says the most obvious solution is to turn the amperage way down when it comes to stainless steel that is also positively false we do turn it down a little bit but we don't really turn it down right <laughs> the reason why is because too low of amperage will absolutely cook your stainless how watch this now here's a simple test you can do this on your own in your own garage as well if you want to really try this theory out. Start with 100 amps and just make a spot weld. You know, any size doesn't really matter. Allow the post flow to run its cycle and all the rest of that good stuff. Now turn the amperage down, subtract 30 amps, so we'll go down to 70. Now blast that same coupon again right next to it and try and match the diameter of the 100 amp spot weld. Make sure that you allow the post flow to run its cycle and it's exactly the same as it was for the 100 amp spot weld. Now, notice the difference. Pay real close attention. Even though we had less amperage going into the part, we had more heat generated because it took more time for the actual spot weld to build up. Now we have a larger heat affected zone, big ring, and it's just pretty much otherwise known as cooked. Let's run it again side by side. 100 amps already done, quick and easy. 70, still waiting for it. The amount of time that goes into that is pretty significant. Even though the amperage was less, the amount of heat is greater. Now when we apply that to a weld, for example, let's just say we'll do a five dabber here. We'll do five dabs at 100 amps, five dabs at 70 amps. The 100 amps wraps up really fast, we're done, we're good to go. The 70 amps takes a lot longer, so with a less amperage, we're forced to go slower, which brings us into our first lesson. Heat is relative to time, not amperage. Time is relevant to travel speed. Now, the less travel speed you have in your part, completely regardless of amperage, the less travel speed you have, the more likely you will cook your stainless. Now, you might be a little bit confused on that one or screaming at me right now saying, Justin, what a bunch of hullabaloo. Well, here is a perfectly good example that demonstrates that. Let's line up another set here for a triple threat. Now, I'm going to kind of advance this here, and you can rewind it and watch it if you need to, whatever the case is. But I'm going to set up three lap welds. I'm going to run one of them at 60 amps, one of them at 90 amps, and one of them at 110 amps. Now, 60 is on the left, 90 in the middle, 110 on the right. Now, watch the time it takes to weld these three. 
Now, all of these are playing in real time right now. We are not speeding up or slowing down a single one of them. We're doing exactly 20 dabs per weld. Now, 110 amps were already finished, just waiting on the post flow. Immediately thereafter, the 90 amps is already finished. Then, we just sit here and wait on that 60 amps to get done. And this takes a hot minute because it's a lot less amperage. But as soon as it does clear and we're finished up, wait for our post flow cycle to finish. And we get to see the results. Now we have 110 amps on the left, 90 amps down the middle, and a 60 amps on the right. Now take a look at our 110 amps. We have a nice, smooth, fluid, neat flowing weld, solid penetration all the way through if we were to cut it in half and etch it. Then we have our 90 amps, which has a little bit higher on the ridge, just a little bit less fluid, but we could get away with it. And then we have our 60 on the right. Our 60 is looking a little bit clumpy and very colorful. The problem that we have on this one is that our 60 amps was not enough to really break into that metal and liquefy it, so we were forced to slow down. Now, we're not just blaming the fact that we have less amperage on this. Let's actually push this and go to 110 amps and just run ridiculously slow. In fact, way too slow. Oh man, this is just painfully slow to watch, but not as painful as this result. Now let's look carefully here. Yes, it looks kind of uniform. A lot of people dig the color, but look at that heat affected zone and look how we actually escaped our gas coverage. Now this is the problem that we have here. We have the correct amount of amperage going into it, but our travel speed is entirely too slow. So slow that we escaped our gas coverage with the heat of the actual metal itself. Now you might say, hey, Hey, let's just throw on a bigger cup on that one but that leads us right into myth number three now myth number three involves cups the actual size of the cup itself now it's widely believed that you have to have a very large cup in order to weld stainless steel and that with it being on there will actually compensate for you and help you work around your inability to keep up with travel speed nonsense that's not what the cup is there for or what it's designed to do now while it can absolutely compensate for some lower travel speed its primary purpose is not to compensate for your inability to keep up with your weld or to maintain your travel speed what it's actually there for is to provide greater coverage over a larger area which when we apply it to a weld in a linear direction it translates to greater distance with greater coverage not compensatory to lack of ability to keep up if that makes any sense, which it probably does, maybe it doesn't, but either way you slice it, this or the larger cup is for covering a greater area, and that's what we're going to cover right now. I'll show you. Number 12 cup up top, number 8 in the middle, number 4 down below. Now I'm going to run all of these with 110 amps, the exact same as we've done before, but this time we have three different cups on here, and I'm utilizing a little bit of a trick to show you the difference between adequate and inadequate coverage, and that is my torch angle, so don't read too much into this, I will explain. But as soon as we have all of these uh, welded up here, we're not counting the dabs, but as soon as all of these are welded up here, let's take a look and analyze the results. Results. Now, all the way on the right, we have our number 12 cup. That is what we call a colorless weld. There's virtually no color in any of it. We can go a greater distance versus, let's say, the number 8, which is in the middle. We have about two-thirds of that weld that is colorful and about a third of it that is colorless, which is the ideal weld. Now, face that against the number 4 cup, which about three-quarters of it is colorful and about a quarter of it is colorless. Now, let's take a look at the upper coupon versus the lower coupon now this was a cheat from that torch angle that I showed you before with the adequate versus inadequate coverage or the one that I mentioned before our number 12 with the inadequate coverage does show a little bit of a color band on it versus the lower coupon that shows virtually no band on it now if we go to the number 8 we have just a tiny bit of heat affected zone versus the upper coupon that has a lot of heat affected zone in fact for a portion of that we escaped our gas coverage with the heat in the actual upper coupon and on the number 4 cup it was even more extreme so either way it's not necessarily the size of the cup that actually manages it it's all about your travel speed your coverage and your torch angle you can have some color if the industry that you work in allows it let's move on 
Now for the sake of thoroughness, let's actually just take some three different coupons and weld them three different ways. So I'm going to start with 110 amps, and this is real time. This is exactly how fast I have to work with 110 amps on this setting. This is pretty quick. But we'll compare it to turn down just a little bit in case you can't run that fast. Here's 90 amps behind the lens. Now this is a little bit slow for me, but the accuracy is you know, still maintained, everything's good. A little bit more heat's going to be generated out of it, but still, this is workable. It's a little bit cooler, but it's workable. Now for that 60 amps, <laughs> just look at how painfully slow this is. The fluttering of the arc is actually the the weld metal solidifying too close to the actual torch itself because it just goes in there and just almost freezes right up. Here's 110 amps restart. Again, get in, get out, hello, goodbye, fill it all up as fast as you can. This is as quick as I can go uh, with the accuracy. Here's a 90 amp restart. It's a little bit slower, but at the same time, we can still work with this. Now, this is full pedal the whole way through. No, no, you know, pulsing, no nothing. Now back to that 60 amp restart this is just unbelievably slow this is just painful to watch all right now having a look at all three of these 60 amps on the right 90 amps in the middle and 110 amps on the left now our 110 amps virtually colorless that's a fantastic weld and that's literally moving as fast as i possibly can with the accuracy that's what we're after 90 amps is a little bit slower and you can see that by uh the amount of small amount of heat signature that's actually on that weld there it's like i said it's doable but if we could pick it up and maintain that accuracy of the weld that's what we're ultimately after nothing really wrong with it but it could be a little bit faster now 60 amps we did have a big hand in uh keeping some of the color out with that giant cup but you can see that there is a tremendous amount of heat that went in there but since we were moving so slow and the gas coverage was fantastic it was it kept up there but at the same time that's not the solution for it and that weld is actually very clumpy very weak very not good that makes you wonder then how did we calculate all these amperage settings well that's where we get into the next lesson so if heat is relative to time and time is relevant to travel speed then we know that we need to match our amperage setting to our travel speed and while we do that we need to move quickly and we need to keep the coverage on it but where exactly do you set your, your amperage at? I mean, this is like the ultimate question because you'll end up asking a lot of people, what was your amperage setting? And you'll see a mix of totally different results because everybody works just a little bit different. Ultimately, I suggest starting around the one amp per thousandth of an inch, then subtract 10%. So if you have a 100, part or 100 amp part that you need to weld or a part that you need to weld at 100 amps, subtract 10%, weld it at 90. Then try to keep up with that. Ultimately, it's not compensating for your lack of ability to keep up with it it's trying to get your ability to keep up with it in the right spot so that's the one of the most important parts but that's the basics of welding stainless steel at least that's the basics of what we need to know in order to actually set up and get going but then we have a big killer in fact we have two major killers of that theory or what will absolutely destroy them in seconds what are they they're your torch height and welding dirty check this out so let's bring in the old sim torch here and we'll get it down to about where we need it and fire it up. And when you fire up a torch, you'll notice that there's a little bit of a cone that comes off of it, that it projects off of it. This is what I usually call the cone zone. Now, this is actually what limits or controls or dictates the size of your puddle and also the heat that goes into it. So the tighter the torch height or the tighter the gap, the better the control you have over your puddle versus if we lift it up we have a much larger cone zone which translates to a much larger puddle now we also get into other things like voltage increase and resistance and all the rest of that good stuff but just basically speaking as easy as it gets the larger the cone you have the bigger the puddle the more heat that you have so you must have a very very tight arc length in order to maintain a nice cool uniform puddle with low heat even though your amperage is up. But let's actually run just a little bit further on this one and we'll show you what it happens when you weld dirty. Now we're gonna show you examples of both, but let's bring in a dirty torch or a dirty tungsten and show you exactly what that looks like as well. Now when you fire a dirty tungsten, you notice that we have this cone that comes out here with a very wide projection and very unstable 
arc on it. It just it literally quivers all over the place. And then regardless of how high or tight or you know your torch height is, or even if you're right on top of it, that projection, due to the fact that it's dirty on there, is projecting very wide. It's literally all over the place. It's unstable. It's very, very difficult to control because the actual metal that's stuck to the tungsten is blocking some of that path, which forces it to project outward, and the tip of it is actually very dirty, kind of balled up. So you lose a lot of control over it, and it literally becomes unusable. So you cannot weld dirty at all. You need that nice, perfect, clean, crisp tungsten on it. But let's actually show you the difference between uh, the two of them, running with a ridiculously high torch height and running dirty. We'll show you the, both of them. Now, it may be a little bit difficult to see this because we're behind the lens and it's just so bright because we have a massive cone on here. But you can see that the heat is generating so much that on that lower coupon there, we're actually expanding that heat affected zone well beyond the gas coverage. It's very difficult to control. And at this point, it's just pretty much I'm having to force feed some rod in there and this thing is just getting wasted. Now let's get it dirty. Three taps on the tungsten with the filler rod just to get it to soak up onto there. That was it's kind of fun doing this, but I'm going to sink this torch height. I'm going to get it right down on point where it needs to be for a correct torch height. But even though it's right down there, just almost kissing the metal, you can see that there's still a massive cone on there. And that's actually cooking the crap out of this metal here because we have no control over that puddle, even though I have it buried in there right where it needs to be. And we'll show you that one in a second as well. But now, just for fun, let's go like some super slow-mo we'll glob this thing up and just dip it right in there boom it's pretty nasty now I'm gonna elevate the torch height on this one and unfortunately I did run out of frame in this shot but you can see just how gigantic that cone is that's on there we have almost zero control over this it's just melting everything and turning into a big glob of junk now <laughs> this is the too high of a torch height. Even though we're running as fast as we can, the torch height is just so insane, and the cone was so huge on that one, we have almost zero control whatsoever. Now compare that to our running dirty with the uh, super tight torch height. Now you can see that there's some uniformity in this one, but it's completely cooked and destroyed. It's completely sunken in. You can see the cone was projecting all over the place. Now even though we had correct torch height, we were still running dirty, and that just absolutely cooked and destroyed this piece. Now take a look at what happens when we run with a really high torch height and a dirty tungsten at the same time. This is just gnarly. This is just completely destroyed. So it's important that you have a good uh, clean tungsten as well as the correct torch height. Otherwise we get results like this every single time. They are two of your biggest killers. So one last round real quick as a recap to tell you the secret of welding stainless steel. Here we go. Now, first and foremost in the secret of welding stainless steel, don't be afraid of the amperage. In fact, use the amperage. The idea is to set your amperage up to somewhere around one amp per thousandth of an inch and then subtract around 10%. The idea is to match your speed with the amperage, not matching the amperage with your speed. Do not go too low on your amperage. That's common to do, but do not go too low on your amperage. If you go too low on your amperage, you will end up either cooking your stainless or not providing a satisfactory weld. That also lines up with keep your torch height as low as possible with your speed up. The lower the torch height, the more focused it is, the better the weld you're going to get and the less effect the amperage has on the weld as long as your speed is sufficient. So make sure that your torch height is as low as possible without actually touching or dragging into the weld. Next, make sure you have ample gas coverage. We're talking lots of it. Stainless steel loves its gas coverage, so weld with a number 12 cup at a bare minimum. Remember, it's not for compensating for slow speed, it's for covering distance over a greater area. In addition to that, do not weld too much at once. Let your part cool down in between passes. A little bit of cooling won't bother it. It won't hurt it. In fact, it will help you. So if you do notice that it's getting too hot, Take a minute, stop, relax, take a break, let it cool down, then go back to it again. Let your part stay nice and cool. Next very important item to the secret of stainless steel is to make sure that your part is very, very, very clean. 
You want to make sure that it's nice and clean, free of debris, oils, dirt, grease. A good uniform finish is a good thing to have, whether it's polished or brushed. Use plenty of acetone. Make sure all of the crevices and cracks between the joints are actually cleaned as well. Remember, dirt can pile in there and all kinds of things can happen. So make sure it's very clean, moisture-free, and good to go. You want to make sure that there's nothing on that part when you weld it. Otherwise, what burns into the stainless stays in the stainless. Now, above all, make sure that you always back purge your stainless if it is exposed to the atmospheric elements on the back side of the weld. Now we have lots of videos on that and we're going to have even more coming up soon, but make sure that you always back purge if your weld is going to be exposed to the atmospheric elements. And above all, the most important secret to welding stainless steel, never, ever, ever stop practicing. Ever. All right, so that is going to wrap it up for this episode, and I want to thank you guys for watching as always. Don't forget to subscribe to the Fabrication Series YouTube channel. Make sure you ring that bell so that way you're in on all of these extras and everything else that we have going on on the YouTube community tab. Now, if you have any questions, go ahead and drop them down in the comments box below. I'll definitely try to get back to you on those. If you need to get in contact with me, you can always hit me up on the FabricationSeries.com website, Instagram at the.fabricator, Facebook.com slash the Fabricator Series, or any other methods that we use to get a hold of me or us or, you know, the whole team or whatever, all of them. So, once again, thank you guys for watching. I'll see you guys on the next episode. Who is screaming? The guys across the series. So the guys across the You know what? I might just... You know what? We're out of here. That's a wrap. Uh, I'm getting out of here. Good job, guys.